If we are peaceful, if we are happy, we can smile and blossom like a flower, and everyone in our family, our entire society, will benefit from our peace. Tishnathan. Better a broken promise than none at all. Befriend those who expand your thinking, not just your circle. You will not be punished for your anger. You will be punished by your anger. Buddha. Have patience. All things are difficult before they become easy. If you want to be successful, you must respect one rule. Never lie to yourself. It's never crowded along the extra mile. Wayne Dyer Did not Socrates love his own children? He did, but it was as a free man, as one who remembered that he must first be a friend to the gods. For this reason he violated nothing which was becoming to a good man, neither in making his defense nor by fixing a penalty on himself nor even in the former part of his life when he was a senator or when B was a soldier. But we are fully supplied with every pretext for being of ignoble temper, some for the sake of a child, some for a mother, and others for brethren's sake. But it is not fit for us to be unhappy on account of any person, but to be happy on account of all, but chiefly on account of God who has made us for this end. Well, did Diogenes love nobody? who was so kind and so much a lover of all that for mankind in general, he willingly undertook so much labor and bodily sufferings. He did love mankind, but how? As became a minister of God at the same time caring for men and being also subject to God. For this reason all the earth was his country and no particular place. And when he was taken prisoner, he did not regret Athens nor his associates and friends there but even he became familiar with the pirates and tried to improve them. And being sold afterward, he lived in Corinth as before at Athens, and he would have behaved the same if he had gone to the country of the Parabi. Thus is freedom acquired. For this reason he used to say, ever since Antisthenes made me free, I have not been a slave. How did Antisthenes make him free? Hear what he says. Antisthenes taught me what is my own and what is not my own. Possessions are not my own, nor kinsmen, domestics, friends, nor reputation, nor places familiar, nor mode of life. All these belong to others. What then is your own? The use of appearances. This be showed to me that I possess it free from hindrance and from compulsion. No person can put an obstacle in my way. No person can force me to use appearances otherwise than I wish. Who then has any power over me? Philip or Alexander or Perdiccas or the great king? How have they this power? For if a man is going to be overpowered by a man, he must long before be overpowered by things. If then pleasure is not able to subdue a man, nor pain, nor fame, nor wealth, but he is able when he chooses, to spit out all his poor body in a man's face and depart from life? Whose slave can he still be? But if he dwelt with pleasure in Athens and was overpowered by this manner of life, his affairs would have been at every man's command. The stronger would have had the power of grieving him. How do you think that Diogenes would have flattered the pirates that they might sell him to some Athenian? that some time he might see that beautiful Piraeus and the long walls and the Acropolis? In what condition would you see them? As a captive, a slave and mean, and what would be the use of it for you? Not so, but I should see them as a free man. Show me how you would be free, 
Observe some person has caught you who leads you away from your accustomed place of abode and says, You are my slave, for it is in my power to hinder you from living as you please. It is in my power to treat you gently and to humble you. When I choose, on the contrary, you are cheerful and go elated to Athens. What do you say to him who treats you as a slave? What means have you of finding one who will rescue you from slavery? Or cannot you even look him in the face? But without saying more, do you entreat to be set free? Man, you ought to go gladly to prison, hastening, going before those who lead you there. Then I ask you, are you unwilling to live in Rome and desire to live in Hellas? And when you must die, will you then also fill us with your lamentations, because you will not see Athens nor walk about in the Lycian? Have you gone abroad for this? Was it for this reason you have sought to find some person from whom you might receive benefit? What benefit? That you may solve syllogisms more readily or handle hypothetical arguments? And for this reason did you leave brother, country, friends, your family, that you might return when you had learned these things? So you did not go abroad to obtain constancy of mind, nor freedom from perturbation, nor in order that being secure from harm, you may never complain of any person, accuse no person, and no man may wrong you, and thus you may maintain your relative position without impediment. This is a fine traffic that you have gone abroad for in syllogisms and sophistical arguments and hypothetical. If you like, take your place in the Agora and proclaim them for sale like dealers in physic. Will you not deny even all that you have learned that you may not bring a bad name on your theorems as useless? What harm has philosophy done you? Wherein has Chrysippus injured you that you should prove by your acts that his labors are useless? Were the evils that you had there not enough, those which were the cause of your pain and lamentation, even if you had not gone abroad, have you added more to the list? And if you again have other acquaintances and friends, you will have more causes for lamentation, and the same also if you take an affection for another country. Why then do you live to surround yourself with other sorrows upon sorrows through which you are unhappy? Then I ask you, do you call this affection? What affection, man? If it is a good thing, it is the cause of no evil. If it is bad, I have nothing to do with it. Stop worrying about what other people think. Honestly. Who gives a damn? If you light a lamp for someone else, it will also brighten your path. There is no easy way from the earth to the stars. Seneca Don't feel harmed and you haven't been. Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. As far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light of meaning in the darkness of mere being. Carl Jung He that is unjust is also impious. For the nature of the universe, having made all reasonable creatures one for another, to the end that they should do one another good, more or less according to the several persons and occasions but in no wise hurt one another, it is manifest that he that doth transgress against this her will is guilty of impiety towards the most ancient and venerable of all the deities. For the nature of the universe is the nature the common parent of all and therefore piously to be observed of all things that are, and that which now is, to whatsoever first was, and gave it its being, hath relation of blood and kindred. She is also called truth, and is the first cause of all truths. 
He therefore that willingly and wittingly doth lie, is impious in that he doth receive, and so commit injustice. But he that against his will, in that he disagreeth from the nature of the universe, and in that striving with the nature of the world, he doth in his particular violate the general order of the world. For he doth no better than strive and war against it, who contrary to his own nature, applieth himself to that which is contrary to truth. For nature had before furnished him with instincts and opportunities sufficient for the attainment of it, which he having hitherto neglected, is not now able to discern that which is false from that which is true. He also that pursues after pleasures, as that which is truly good and flies from pains, as that which is truly evil, is impious. For such a one must of necessity oftentimes accuse that common nature as distributing many things both unto the evil and unto the good, not according to the deserts of either, as unto the bad oftentimes pleasures and the causes of pleasures, so unto the good, pains, and the occasions of pains. Again, he that feareth pains and crosses in this world, feareth some of those things which some time or other must needs happen in the world, and that we have already showed to be impious. And he that pursueth after pleasures will not spare, to compass his desires, to do that which is unjust, and that is manifestly impious. Now those things which unto nature are equally indifferent, for she had not created both, both pain and pleasure, if both had not been unto her equally indifferent. They that will live according to nature must in those things, as being of the same mind and disposition that she is, be as equally indifferent. Whosoever therefore in either matter of pleasure and pain, death and life, honor and dishonor, which things nature in the administration of the world indifferently doth make use of, is not as indifferent. It is apparent that he is impious. When I say that common nature doth indifferently make use of them, my meaning is that they happen indifferently in the ordinary course of things, which by a necessary consequence, whether as principle or accessory, come to pass in the world, according to that first and ancient deliberation of providence, by which she from some certain beginning did resolve upon the creation of such a world, conceiving then in her womb as it were some certain rational generative seeds and faculties of things future, whether subjects, changes, successions, both such and such, and just so many. Remember, you beat a billion odds by being here. Be grateful for the little things in life that others take for granted. If you are the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. Sapere Aude, dare to know, Horace. You cannot have a positive life in a negative mind. No matter how hard you work, you can't have everything you want. Eventually, most of us end up settling in some part of our life. Time is the most valuable currency. Spend it wisely. Alex Hormozzi to a certain rhetorician who was going up to Rome on a suit. When a certain person came to him who was going up to Rome on account of a suit which had regard to his rank, Epictetus inquired the reason of his going to Rome, and the man then asked what he thought about the matter. Epictetus replied, If you ask me what you will do in Rome, whether you will succeed or fall, I have no rule about this. But if you ask me how you will fare, I can tell you. If you have right opinions, you will fare well. If they are false, you will fare ill. For to every man the cause of his acting is opinion. For what is the reason why you desired to be elected governor of the Nossians? Your opinion. What is the reason that you are now going up to Rome? Your opinion. And going in winter and with danger and expense. I must go. What tells you this? your opinion, 
than if opinions are the causes of all actions and a man has bad opinions, such as the cause may be, such also is the effect. Have we then all sound opinions, both you and your adversary? And how do you differ? But have you sounder opinions than your adversary? Why? You think so. And so does he think that his opinions are better. And so do madmen. This is a bad criterion. But show to me that you have made some inquiry into your opinions, and have taken some pains about them. And as now, you are sailing to Rome in order to become governor of the Canossians, and you are not content to stay at home with the honors which you had, but you desire something greater and more conspicuous. So when did you ever make a voyage for the purpose of examining your own opinions and casting them out, if you have any that are bad? Whom have you approached for this purpose? What time have you fixed for it? What age? Go over the times of your life by yourself, if you are ashamed of me. When you were a boy, did you examine your own opinions? And did you not then, as you do all things now, do as you did do? And when you were become a youth and attended the rhetoricians, and yourself practiced rhetoric, what did you imagine that you were deficient in? And when you were a young man and engaged in public matters, and pleaded causes yourself, and were gaining reputation, who then seemed your equal? And when would you have submitted to any man examining and show that your opinions are bad? What then do you wish me to say to you? Help me in this matter. I have no theorem, rule, for this. Nor have you, if you came to me for this purpose, come to me as a philosopher, but as to a seller of vegetables or a shoemaker. For what purpose then have philosophers' theorems? For this purpose, that whatever may happen, our ruling faculty may be and continue to be conformable to nature. Does this seem to you a small thing? No, but the greatest. What then? Does it need only a short time? And is it possible to seize it as you pass by? If you can, seize it. Then you will say, I met with Epictetus as I should meet with a stone or a statue. For you saw me and nothing more. But he meets with a man as a man who learns his opinions, and in his turn shows his own. Learn my opinions, show me yours, and then say that you have visited me. Let us examine one another. If I have any bad opinion, take it away. If you have any, show it. This is the meaning of meeting with a philosopher. Not so, but this is only a passing visit. And while we are hiring the vessel, we can also see Epictetus. Let us see what he says. Then you go away and say, Epictetus was nothing. He used solecisms and spoke in a barbarous way. For of what else do you come as judges? Well, but a man may say to me, If I attend to such matters, I shall have no land, as you have none. I shall have no silver cups, as you have none, nor fine beasts, as you have none. In answer to this, it is perhaps sufficient to say, I have no need of such things. But if you possess many things, you have need of others. Whether you choose or not, you are poorer than I am. What then have I need of? of that which you have not, of firmness, of a mind which is conformable to nature, of being free from perturbation. Whether I have a patron or not, what is that to me? But it is something to you. I am richer than you. I am not anxious what Caesar will think of me. For this reason I flatter no man. This is what I possess instead of vessels of silver and gold. You have utensils of gold, but your discourse, your opinions, your assents, your movements, your desires are of earthenware. But when I have these things conformable to nature, why should I not employ my studies also upon reason? For I have leisure, my mind is not distracted. What shall I do since I have no distraction? What more suitable to a man have I than this? 
When you have nothing to do, you are disturbed, you go to the theater or you wander about without a purpose. Why should not the philosopher labor to improve his reason? You employ yourself about crystal vessels. I employ myself about the syllogism named the living. You about marine vessels. I employ myself about the syllogism named the denying. To you everything appears small that you possess. To me all that I have appears great. Your desire is insatiable. Mine is satisfied. To children who put their hand into a narrow-necked earthen vessel and bring out figs and nuts, this happens. If they fill the hand, they cannot take it out, and then they cry. Drop a few of them, and you will draw things out. And do you part with your desires? Do not desire many things, and you will have what you want. When anger rises, think of the consequences. Lost time is never found again. Three things cannot be long hidden. The sun, the moon, and the truth. Buddha. Waste no more time arguing what a good man should be. Be one. Never trust what someone says, watch what they do. Your imagination is the only reality, Neville Goddard. On Precognitions Precognitions are common to all men, and precognition is not contradictory to precognition. For who of us does not assume that good is useful and eligible, and in all circumstances that we ought to follow and pursue it? And who of us does not assume that justice is beautiful and becoming? When, then, does the contradiction arise? It arises in the adaptation of the precognitions to the particular cases. When one man says, he has done well, he is a brave man, and another says, not so, but he has acted foolishly. Then the disputes arise among men. This is the dispute among the Jews and the Syrians and the Egyptians and the Romans, not whether holiness should be preferred to all things and in all cases should be pursued, but whether it is holy to eat pig's flesh or not holy. You will find this dispute also between Agamemnon and Achilles, for call them forth. What do you say? Agamemnon ought not that to be done which is proper and right? Certainly. Well, what do you say, Achilles? Do you not admit that what is good ought to be done? I do most certainly. Adapt your precognitions then to the present matter. Here the dispute begins. Agamemnon says, I ought not to give up Chryseis to her father. Achilles says, You ought. It is certain that one of the two makes a wrong adaptation of the precognition of ought, or duty. Further, Agamemnon says, Then if I ought to restore Chryseis, it is fit that I take his prize from some of you. Achilles replies, Would you then take her whom I love? Yes, her whom you love. Must I then be the only man who goes without a prize? And must I be the only man who has no prize? Thus the dispute begins. What then is education? Education is the learning how to adapt the natural precognitions to the particular things conformably to nature, and then to distinguish that of things some are in our power, but others are not. In our power are will and all acts which depend on the will, Things not in our power are the body, the parts of the body, possessions, parents, brothers, children, country, and generally all with whom we live in society. In what, then, should we place the good? To what kind of things shall we adapt it? To the things which are in our power. Is not health, then, a good thing, and soundness of limb and life? And are not children and parents and country? who will tolerate you if you deny this. 
Let us then transfer the notion of good to these things. Is it possible then, when a man sustains damage and does not obtain good things, that he can be happy? It is not possible. And can he maintain toward society a proper behavior? He cannot. For I am naturally formed to look after my own interest. If it is my interest to have an estate in land, it is my interest also to take it from my neighbor. If it is my interest to have a garment, it is my interest also to steal it from the bath. This is the origin of wars, civil commotions, tyrannies, conspiracies, and how shall I be still able to maintain my duty toward Zeus? For if I sustain damage and am unlucky, he takes no care of me. And what is he to me if he allows me to be in the condition in which I am? I now begin to hate him. Why then do we build temples? Why set up statues to Zeus, as well as to evil demons, such as to fever? And how is Zeus the savior, and how the giver of rain, and the giver of fruits? And in truth, if we place the nature of good in any such things, all this follows. What should we do then? This is the inquiry of the true philosopher who is in labor. Now I do not see what the good is, nor the bad. Am I not mad? Yes. But suppose that I place the good somewhere among the things which depend on the will. All will laugh at me. There will come some gray head wearing many gold rings on his fingers, and he will shake his head and say, Here, my child, it is right that you should philosophize, but you ought to have some brains also. All this that you are doing is silly. You learn the syllogism from philosophers, but you know how to act better than philosophers do. Man, why then do you blame me if I know? What shall I say to this slave? If I am silent, he will burst. I must speak in this way. Excuse me, as you would excuse lovers. I am not my own master. I am mad. No matter how smart, successful, and good-looking you are, nobody likes arrogance. You might be the sweetest peach on the tree, but some people just don't like peaches. If you want to make enemies, try to change something. Woodrow Wilson You will be left with nothing. Don't let yourself be controlled by three things. People, money, or past experience. You cannot always control what goes on outside, but you can always control what goes on inside. Wayne Dyer What is that that is slow and yet quick, merry and yet grave, he that in all things doth follow reason for his guide? Learn to wing it. If you make a girl laugh, you can make her do anything. That which is an impediment to action is turned to advance action. The obstacle on the path becomes the way. Marcus Aurelius Holding on to things will always make you more stressed. Stay quiet about your goals. Soon your results will do all the talking. If you view all the things that happen to you, both good and bad, as opportunities, then you operate out of a higher level of consciousness. Les Brown What is the property of error? Every error comprehends contradiction, for since he who errs does not wish to err, but to he right it is plain that he does not do what he wishes. 
For what does the thief wish to do? That which is for his own interest. If then the theft is not for his interest, 